Pulaski County title, which is in the central part of Arkansas, uh, Little Rock being our uh, county seat and the uh, state capital, of course. Uh, I'm past president of the Arkansas Land Title Association. I've been legislative chair for a number of years. Uh, like you guys, we're a relatively small group, so I find myself sort of rotating in and out of uh, different board positions. Currently, I don't serve on the board. Uh, I'm also really involved in the American Land Title Association uh, as our state type chair, and I sit on the e-closing task force uh, with the American Land Title Association. Um, I help with our CE classes, like you guys, we have to have six hours per year. I understand you guys have 12 for over two years. Um, and I try to come up with stuff that's interesting, uh, and I just happened to trip over this subject that I'm giving you guys in an abbreviated version uh, a number of years ago when I was serving on the board. So at my convention in Little Rock, we loaded a bus and went to the Louisiana Purchase State Park, which I'm going to show you a video about that. Um, and go over some some history, which parlays into what we do. Can you turn day. your mic on? Yeah, that'll probably help. Is that better? Can you hear me? Okay. So we loaded about fifty-five people on a bus and took a an hour and a half ride to the Louisiana Purchase State Park, and then we had a CE. Uh, engagement there and lunch and then came back. So I had them captive for about four or five hours. So I'm going to give you guys a much abbreviated version. Um, and I'm kind of going to jump ahead just so everybody knows what's sitting on the table. Um, there are original documents, uh, land patents in particular, uh, which for those most of you probably know, land patent is the first link in the chain of title where public lands become private. Um, and Presidents Washington through Truman's administration issued land patents before it was delegated to the Bureau of Land Management. Um, incidentally, you can go to the Bureau of Land Management and pull the patents for your for whatever property you're interested in. Uh, most of them are available uh, digitized for you, and you can actually pull copies of them. These are originals that are sitting on this table. George Washington through Andrew Jackson physically signed the documents. In Jackson's second term, it became too heavy of a lift and Congress <coughs> passed a piece of legislation which allowed a secretary to be appointed by the president to sign those. So if you have one that is Theodore Roosevelt, it is not presidential signed, it's secretary signed. There's only a very, very, very rare few where the president signed those when after the uh, secretary was designated. designated. You'll find examples of George Washington's signature, uh, John Adams, uh, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, and John Quincy Adams. The patent to the far right is George Washington's personal land patent for service in the Revolutionary War. When he died, he had 18,000 acres. That represents 2,000 of the 18,000. And that's the original document that George Washington would have had, where he was the grantee for his service in the Revolutionary War. Um, when our uh, nation was really young, we didn't have a lot of money, a lot of cash, but we had a lot of land. And so Revolutionary War veterans uh, received uh, land for their service in the Revolutionary War. And so the three patents, George Washington's patent, the one he signed, and the one that uh, John Adams signed that are on the table, on the right side of the table, those are Revolutionary War land grants for service in the Revolutionary War. Uh, the ones to the left of the table, the far left, are... Uh, veterans of the War of 1812, uh, where they were given 160 acres for their service. Incidentally, Revolutionary War veterans received a whole lot more land than veterans of the War of 1812. Uh, veterans of the War of 1812 either received 160 or 320 acres, depending on their rank, and Revolutionary War veterans, depending on their rank, received between 1,000 and 2,000 acres. You'll also notice on George Washington's land patent where he received the land, his initials, that he, he also surveyed the land, and he was a, he was a surveyor. Um, so, the chains and the vernier compass that are there. So, when you're in an airplane and you look down, including your own state, you see the townships uh, and sections within those townships. Uh, that, a chain like that one, that chain's from about 1850, so that's probably a, a later version. Um, and the vernier compass, which were made by jewelry makers, was, and the burning compass was mounted on either a staff or a tripod, 
and they drug those through the thick woods and identified the different corners uh, of what would become the section, the townships, and then later sections. So it gives you an idea of really, you know, nowadays where we have GPS and a lot of accuracy, uh, back then they had some pretty rudimentary tools and they did a pretty good job. The question came, if the survey, if the, the, the crew that laid those out, if they laid them out in the wrong spot, was it the wrong spot or the right spot? It's the right spot because that's where they put it. So whether it was long or short or off, it doesn't matter. And we see that part of it. But anyway, that's what those represent. So I'm gonna get back to, to I'm gonna show you about a 25 minute presentation. Um, every piece of property in Arkansas, Missouri, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, and Minnesota is measured from a single point of beginning. So all the way to the Canadian border. And that point of beginning is at the intersection of the fifth prime meridian and the baseline, which is about um, an, it's about an hour directly east of Little Rock. And it's in a headwater swamp. And people say, why did they start in a headwater swamp? They didn't start in a headwater swamp. They started at two most fixed positions, the mouth of the St. Francis and Mississippi River and the Arkansas and Mississippi River. One went west and formed the baseline, one went north and formed the fifth prime meridian. Where they intersected, and one overshot it by a day and had to come back, but where they intersected is the point of beginning. But if you want to get really technical about it, there's two points of beginning, and that's at the intersection of those rivers that I mentioned. But all properties are measured off of that single point of beginning. And I realized a number of years ago that even the old timers within our group had forgotten the relevance of the point of beginning. And so it made for a really cool scene when, uh, when we did that. So although you're here in Hot Springs and we're not in the park, I think you'll get a pretty good perspective on it by watching the video that I'm going to show you. Just some fun facts about the Louisiana Purchase first. Uh, in 1803, when Napoleon Bonaparte agreed to transfer the lands that make up the Louisiana Purchase, who owned it? Anybody want to guess at that? It's a loaded question. So almost everybody says the French, but actually it's Spain owned it. So Spain had agreed to convey it to France, and it had a caveat, and that was that France wasn't supposed to transfer it to anybody else. It was to revert back to Spain if France ever transferred it. But France agreed to sell it. Uh, the United States agreed to buy it. They really went to go negotiate the Port of New Orleans to protect the trade route, and instead they ended up with a whole ton of land. So, to our group, I said, well, if the title insurance policy had been written, would there have been a claim because they were mercenary clause? Uh, it was verbal, and uh, they, they didn't, although it was kind of uh, created a big buzz at the time, nothing ever became of it. Uh, France was trying to raise money to fight Great Britain, which they never, never, they never did. Um, and ironically, a lot of the money that we borrowed came from the bond houses in Great Britain and also Amsterdam. So I'll give you some fun facts. So this is the land that makes up the western watershed of the Mississippi River primarily. Uh, of course, when they agreed to buy this, they really didn't know how much land that, was, that, that it was until they sent out the expeditions. There were actually three expeditions. Uh, Lewis and Clark is the, the most well-known. But the Hunter Dunbar expedition um, started out in northern Louisiana and actually ended right here in Hot Springs. And so that expedition, although not known as well, really is more relevant to Arkansas. You knows Oklahoma was included. I put it in real. <laughs> okay, so it contained 828,000 square miles or 530 million acres. It was $15 million. Um, there was forgiveness of debt, believe it or not, uh, France of Ogilus, and some money as a long story over to it. Um, and the remaining balance was finance, like we talked about. It took 20 years to repay the balance, 6% interest, and the total uh, purchase price, including interest, was 20 million. The, it's, I haven't actually confirmed this, but it's rumored that a lot of the funds that were raised to pay that back came through immigration fees. 
original purchase price was about three cents per acre. So I've used a couple of ways to try to adjust for inflation and figure out what that would be in today's dollars. And you can do it based on gross domestic product, value of the dollar. It's less than $100 an acre, probably somewhere in like the $62 an acre range today. That's the best land buy ever. It affected uh, 12 to 15 present U.S. states in two Canadian provinces. Believe it or not, we actually owned part of Canada, and then we had a treaty some years later, which sort of cleaned up that line. I talked about this already. Okay, so um, Spain conveyed the property to France on November the 30th of 1803. They negotiated it in April of 1803, uh, November the 30th, and then 20 days later, France flipped it to us. Okay, so that's what makes up the land that became the, uh, the Louisiana Purchase once we figured out what it was. So I'm going to show you a video um, that AETN put together that sort of will take you, the best way I can transport you to the point of beginning and give you an idea of the significance. Some of it will work for you. Additional support provided by the Arkansas Community Foundation, the Butler Foundation, and the Donald W. Reynolds Foundation.
together here. It was an accident, she had everything. We needed a data point, a starting point for the surveys. And the two most fundamental, biggest, most stable landmarks in general that you could find in that area were the maps of those two rivers. Mark the land, 
squash, beans, and corn, and hunted buffalo and turkey. Throughout the territory, they were known for their artistry. I like to say that they were artisans. I think the father was dark yard and still kind of manufacturers, but they really got their subsistence by making these fabulous pots. They were known by the French for you know, they got canoes. Everything they did was of a finer quality, I think, than a lot of other people that the French were dealing with. And a lot of the Indians would come in and trade with the local tribe. That trade networks that were all very good. Smith was a small Morgan stone stockade. He 
Case for the hill on a bluff overlooking the confluence of the Arkansas and Pueblo rivers. It was a lonely and isolated station, never housing more than 130 soldiers. The garrison, consisting of two block houses and lines of cabins or barracks for the accommodations of 70 men, is agreeably situated. The view is more commanding and picturesque than any other spot of legal elevation on the banks of the Arkansas. Thomas Mantle, 1819. From the last seven years, from 1978 to 1994, before it was established, it was successful in its mission. Uh, the move with the exception of a couple of isolated incidents, uh, I don't have to shoot to, uh, to stop the fight. This is the outpost in the middle of nowhere, stopping the war. negotiated a peace treaty between the Osage and Cherokee. Two years later, the army abandoned the garrison. Some of the soldiers decided to stay and settle in the Fort Smith area on surveyed land deeded to them as veterans of the War of 1812. The same year the army left Fort Smith, the Arkansas territorial government decided the Quapaw had outlived their usefulness. The aborigines of this territory, now commonly called the Akanze, or Quapaws, or Ozarks, do not at this time number more than about 200 warriors. Thomas Nuttall, botanist. They were reduced to numbers, and they were the geographical irritants of the territory. Quapaw Chief Hecaton pleaded with the territorial governor to allow his people to stay in Arkansas. To leave my native soil and go home and bring men who are alien to our race is throwing us like outcasts upon the world. Have mercy. Send us not there. Hecaton, Quapaw. Hecaton's pleas were ignored, and the Quapaw signed the treaty and moved to the southwest joining the Caddo on the Red River in Louisiana. And the Quapaws died, I think that they were trapped out of starvation when they were the Caddo's. The lands that they were put on flooded, uh, provisions didn't come through, and a lot of the Quapaws escaped back into Pine Bluff. But the Quapaws were not welcomed back. In 1835, one year before statehood, the Arkansas Indians were removed to the northeast corner of Oklahoma, where to this day, tribal members make their home. The territory of Arkansas included the present-day states of both Oklahoma and Arkansas. In 1836, when Arkansas was admitted to the Union as the 25th state, Oklahoma was cut off, becoming Indian territory.
Mississippi River. But of all possible places, the Louisiana Purchase Survey began in remote eastern Arkansas, in a swamp between the mouths of the Arkansas and St. Francis Rivers. And having established that point, you see, then you could go on and, uh, and, and basically continue the, the survey, essentially, with the rest of the country. But you have to have a starting point. And that's what's critical about that spot over there uh, in the middle of that spot. May your mind both north and west across this swampy wilderness from fall and to where the north and wrong. We'll turn to our village till we're proud and settler finally well. But for men and yet to come, this will be home. Starting here. So James Monroe sold pawned all of his personal or a lot of his personal items, including silverware in China, dishware, to pay for that expedition. Congress gave him twenty thousand dollars later to offset those expenditures, but when he passed, he was bankrupt. He never came out of that hole. So I like to think when I'm working on the transactions that we work on every day that we make a living at, that there was somebody a long time ago that made that possible. Because every piece of property that we both touch whether here in Arkansas or Oklahoma came out of that purchase. Anyway, thanks for having me today.